The Tom Woods Show, episode 548. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Zappable makes it easy to design mobile apps for local businesses. And since nobody else is going to be approaching local businesses in person with an app proposal, you've got the field to yourself. Check it out at TomWoods.com slash Zap. Hello and welcome to episode 548. Today we're talking about water. We're talking about water in the form of lakes and rivers and oceans. We're talking about privatizing these bodies of water. Why you'd want to do it, how you would do it, how it would work, what the results would be, what the technical feasibility is, all these sorts of questions are going to be answered today with our old friend Walter Block. And you may know Walter. He has nearly 500 articles in peer-reviewed publications. Of course, that doesn't include thousands of articles in popular publications. He has many books, most famously Defending the Undefendable. But today we're going to be talking about his brand new book, co-authored, called Water Capitalism. The Case for Privatizing Oceans, Rivers, Lakes, and Aquifers. Walter Block is a distinguished professor of economics at Loyola University in New Orleans and a senior fellow of the Mises Institute. Walter, welcome to the show. My pleasure. Always good to be with you. Walter, what a pioneer you are. It's ridiculous to think about all the the topics that you cover that nobody else touches. So your new book is Water Capitalism, and it involves the case, I I gave the whole subtitle uh, to the audience a moment ago, but we're talking about privatizing bodies of water. Now this is something that is going to strike people as just uh, crazy and out of bounds, and yet for me it never did, and not just because I'm a libertarian, but my view is, what's the difference? It's just because something is wet, that means people can't own it? What's the difference? If you can homestead dry things, why can't you homestead wet things? It, it doesn't seem like there should be any big deal here, but I'm, you know, I'm an unusual person. Let's start off with the obvious question, which would be, and this is actually one of your chapter titles, why bother, basically? Why, why privatize bodies of water? Aren't they being adequately managed now? Forgetting about the justice of the whole thing, aren't they being pretty well taken care of now? Sure. The government is doing a great job, Tom. (laughs) Uh, No, uh, there are several reasons. One, uh, perhaps the most important, is to show the depth and uh, breadth of libertarianism, that uh, we believe in private property, and uh, government property is, uh, or the tragedy of the commons is uh, is a problem. And we just have one more way of demonstrating this. Uh, This book actually is part of a trilogy of mine, Uh, The first one was why we should privatize highways, streets, and roads. The second one is this, why we should privatize uh, oceans, rivers, lakes, and aquifers. And the third one that I'm now working on is why we should privatize space, uh, the space uh, exploration, the moon, Mars, uh, asteroids, things like that. So one reason is to promote liberty. Another reason, I think, uh, is uh, maybe economic, Right now, uh, the oceans comprise, oh, 75% of the Earth's surface and land 25%. And I've been trying to get some good data on what the GDP that emanates from each of them is. And my best guess or guesstimate is 1% from, uh, <laughs> from the water and uh, 99% from the land. And yet the water is, uh, you know, 75%. So there's a, a vi- gigantic disparity uh, between the two. And uh, third is, uh, you know, problems like uh, uh, spills, uh, oil spills in the ocean, Exxon Valdez, for example, or running out of fish stocks, things like that. So those are three reasons, I suppose, for wanting to uh, uh, move on toward privatizing uh, oceans, rivers, lakes, uh, whatever. And, And the point that you made before uh, you know, just because it's wet, we shouldn't privatize it, I, I think is uh, absolutely crucial and, and very insightful. And my, my view is that uh, water is just slow-moving, uh, fast-moving land, and land is just slow-moving water, namely there's a continuum. Because, look, sometimes uh, the water is in the form of ice, and ice is, you know, just roughly as solid as, as um uh, land and sometimes land moves also. We have mudslides, we have landslides, we have uh, I don't know uh, 
uh, silt moving from here to there. So uh, there's a continuum between land and water, and, and uh, it's true we can make a distinction. Uh, we use different words for the two of them, but still uh, there's a continuum, and, and what's good for the one, uh, at least we should explore whether it's good for the other. We shouldn't reject it and say, well, you know, because it's wet, we can't privatize it. That's crazy. Tell me a little bit about your co-author, because my understanding, as I recall the beginning of this project, was that you brought him on because he had some expertise in some of the technical questions related to water that you might not know about. Yes, it's a very interesting uh, issue. I wanted to, uh, uh, well, I did the uh, road privatization, road streets and highways, and then I wanted to get onto the water. And then I started running in all sorts of problems like water pressure and, and currents and things like that, that I, you know, uh, a Jewish boy from Brooklyn would have no business knowing about. So I uh, took out, I don't think an ad, but I, I wrote somewhere, maybe on the Lou Rockwell blog, I forget where it was, probably there. And I said, look, I'm now contemplating uh, writing a book on uh, privatizing oceans, and I need a Rothbardian uh, anarcho-capitalist. Uh, that, that's a uh, uh, a requirement because you know who can co-author a book with, with somebody who's not uh, a Rothbardian anarcho-capitalist. And then I said, uh, here's a, a, a problem, uh, some sort of problem, and, and it's in one of the chapters now. Uh, some lake in in Florida, they were having problems with it, and I knew the the right answer, namely privatized. But I, for the life of me, I really couldn't fill in the uh, in the details. So I said, look, please uh, write me an article, and uh, you know, uh, I'll pick the one that I think is uh, the most conducive to me or the, the one uh, where I, I have the most in common with the author. And I, four or five people wrote essays on this. And I picked the one uh, written by Peter Nelson, my co-author, and I said, look, uh, this is a very low risk thing because it's an interesting question about this lake in, in Florida. And um, if I don't pick you, you know, you're free to publish it somewhere else. So you're not going to lose much by writing it uh, for me, and uh, the winner uh, will get to be my co-author, and uh, we'll go on from there. And Peter Nelson wrote a brilliant essay on this, and uh, I chose him, and I never regretted it. And indeed, uh, he he's an engineer uh, of liquids, <laughs> which is uh, very important, and he's the one who I'm now co-authoring the next book in this series on uh, space, uh, privatizing the moon, Mars, uh, and asteroids and stuff like that. I just, I think I just saw an item. I, I, I must, have, you must have seen it as well on Wenzel's site about how it's it's considered legal to own an asteroid. Did you happen to see that item? Yes, uh, thank goodness okay. for our president. Um, although um, I sort of have misgivings about that. The the most recent thing is that Obama wrote that if you uh, go to an astero uh, asteroid and you homestead it and you privatize it, you get to own it. And uh, previously, the law was uh, space uh, will forever be in the commons. Namely, no one can ever own anything privately, only governments, uh, presumably. And on the one hand, this is obviously good because, you know, uh, we, fa we libertarians favor <laughs> privatization and homesteading. On the other hand, it sort of seems uh, a little bit uh, problematic because who the hell is he to may be making rules about uh, what goes on in space? Uh, he, he's only the president of the United States. And the last I uh, uh, knew, uh, the United States is on Earth. It's got nothing to do with the moon or Mars or asteroids or anything like that. So why the temerity on his part? But, you know, given that he has the temerity, I'm, I'm glad he came out on that side. He could have uh, come out on the other side. So I sort of welcome it, but I'm a little ambivalent about it. Well, I had a feeling, you know, I knew that the one silver lining to his election was, I had a feeling he was sound on the asteroid question, so I've been <laughs> totally vindicated on this, as it turns out. All right, let's let's stick to water, though. Let, let's start easy. Let's talk about a lake, because with rivers, you got moving water, and with the ocean, well, it's the ocean, so let's talk about a lake. How does private ownership of a lake, what does that look like? Are there examples of private ownerships of uh, private ownership of lakes, as far as you know? Yes, uh, the uh, very small little lakes of an acre or two uh, are privately owned, but don't say that they don't move because if it doesn't move, it's totally stagnant. Although some lakes are like that, 
Uh, but right, but I'm thinking about the usual downstream problem that I pollute upstream and it floats downstream to right. the, the river or somebody else's property. I want to get to that later. But but in dealing with a lake, what what would a private owner do with a lake? What would it look like? Well, the private owner, uh, let's say there's one guy who owns the lake, and let's say he owns all the land around it, so that it uh, it's simple. And what he could do is uh, sell plots around the lake, and uh, you could build a house, and now you have a right to uh, get on the lake, sort of like a condominium. Uh, if you uh, purchase the condominium house, uh, you would have access to the common grounds, you know, the swings or the swimming pool, to mention something that's liquid. So just think of this lake as like a big swimming pool. Uh, and then... Uh, or he could uh, uh, use it for different purposes. He could use it for um, uh, fishing, uh, and he could charge fishermen uh, a price to go and fish or people for boating. He could even use it, God forbid, as a dump site. I mean, not all lakes or all land have to be pristine. Uh, we have to dump uh, garbage somewhere, and maybe uh, we should dump garbage in the lake. And he will, uh, assuming that there's no downstream or upstream issues uh, for the moment, uh, he could uh, use it as a garbage dump, and he would if the price were such that he could make more profits that way, assuming uh, he was just interested in monetary profits and not aesthetic uh, uh, psychic income. So, in other words, it would just be a question of uh, just figuring out what the highest value productive use of the lake would be. Maybe it would be opening it to the public for swimming or fishing. Maybe it would be using it for more mundane purposes that you mentioned, but it would be a question of the way we allocate any other resource in the world. Precisely. Uh, you know, there's always, you see, if the lake is publicly owned, then you have uh, conflicts because uh, if you have motorboats and swimming, it's a little incompatible because the motorboat might knock a swimmer on the head or something like that. Uh, and what he could say is, uh, in this section of the lake, you can have motorboats, but over here you can only have swimming or whatever. Uh, in other words, there are always alternative uses on all scarce resources, and the owner, just like the owner of a, a patch of land, look, suppose instead of one square mile lake, it was one square mile land. Well, he could put corn in there, he could build houses, he could put a dump site in, he could uh, put uh, residential housing, he could put a high rise on the land, well, it would be very similar. And what the, I wouldn't say the essence of this book is, but one of the aspects of this book is to look upon water uh, the way we look upon land a little bit more, and namely, uh, we can privatize land, so let's think of privatizing water. Let's go to the, what in my view is the next most difficult question would be the case of a river. Are you envisioning the private ownership of an entire river or portions of the river? And if it's portions of the river, how do you deal with stuff flowing into your portion of the river? And what would you do with a portion of a river? Well, uh, the way I see it, and uh, we did have one chapter uh, where my co-author and I had a little bit of a debate of uh, whether it, it should be, you know, how, how just how should the river be owned? Uh, my view would be the Mississippi River would be a, a unit. Murray Rothbard, in his excellent, uh, magnificent article on air pollution, uh, talked about the uh, technological unit. And you have to have a technological unit. Uh, you, you just can't own a sliver of the river, and it gets too complicated. And uh, the way I see it is uh, the Mississippi River would now be owned by the Mississippi River Corporation, and the Mississippi River Corporation would be uh, uh, owned by uh, the people who homesteaded it. Uh, and we can assume that people who had land contiguous to the river uh, used it, and, and maybe those uh, owners of the boats that were uh, going up and down the river would get to own it. So the way I see it, the Mississippi River Corporation now has, oh, 100,000 shares, one for each of the owners of it, and the owners of it elect a, a board of uh, trustees or a board of directors of the, of the um, uh, corporation, and then they decide on, you know, uh, how it works. And uh, they're probably not going to allow people in Minnesota to start polluting it so that when it gets down to where I am uh, in New Orleans, uh, it's uh, filthy and unusable. Uh, because it would be one contiguous uh, unit. So um, one of the motivations for that was uh, what happened with Katrina. What happened with Katrina, by the way, Katrina missed New Orleans by about 50 miles. It really hit Mississippi. The reason that New Orleans, which is a little bit below sea level, uh, got inundated is because the Army Corps of Engineers had those levees, and those levees failed. 
And as, uh, as a humanist, I mean, this is horrible because 1,900 people died. As an economist, what really rankles is that these people are still in business. Uh, whereas if, you know, if uh, McDonald's poisons people, uh, well, Burger King will take over and Wendy's will take over and there'll be no more McDonald's. But here, uh, the, in effect, the owners of the river, the, the Army Corps of Engineers or the government, uh, just go on blithely owning it and uh, life goes on or death goes on as it was before. So the idea is that uh, the Mississippi River Corporation would do a better job because if they do a, a poor job, they'll lose profits and uh, they'll be purchased, uh, bought out by some other board of directors, and it'll, it'll be run like any other private corporation. I think people hear private corporation and they think pollution and greed and short-term thinking, but it's not corporations that think that way. It's that that's the incentive structure they operate in when the state owns everything. Absolutely. So yeah, they have an incentive to engage in those things, but they hear corporation and they're going to think that in your system, it's just going to be, uh, you know, Coke cans all over the river. <laughs> well, if that's the way to maximize profits, uh, then yes, but uh, <laughs> uh, the, the likelihood of that uh, occurring and, you know, these Coke cans getting into the, uh, into the ship's uh, propellers, <laughs> I, I don't think that that would be the way that it would be run. Uh, and, you know, this idea of greed and capitalism, corporations, well, you know, it need not be a corporation if you hate the corporate form. It could be just a big partnership, but uh, uh, presumably it would be a corporation, limited liability corporation, which is a whole other issue. Are those, you know, the uh, uh, just the creatures of the state or not? And I don't think so. I think a corporation is one legitimate uh, way of running things. Another problem, whenever people hear private enterprise, is not only greed and capitalism, uh, but they say, well, what about the poor? You know, the poor would now have to pay for something that they get for free. And uh, th this would be a criticism, again, not just of a, a, a watery corporation, but of a, uh, any kind of corporation. Uh, you know, we now name uh, the highways called the freeways, and we think that, you know, we get them for free. We should really call them taxways because people pay for them. And, you know, the question about the poor is, you know, where are the poor better off? Are the poor better off in a largely capitalist society, which is very wealthy? Or are they better off in, uh, I don't know, uh, Venezuela or Cuba or, or North Korea, where uh, uh, the government owns everything and the people don't have to pay any money for anything? Everything is free, and uh, we all starve happily, uh, happily ever after. So I, I, don't, I don't think that any of these... Um, uh, objections are any more valid for uh, land or water. I think it's the same thing. Uh, we're on, on the same level uh, if you object to land ownership or water ownership. It's the same thing. And, and we've got a whole wealth of literature, we libertarians and Austrian economists, uh, saying that private enterprise runs better on the land. And what I'm just trying to do is extrapolate and say that it, uh, it applies for water too. I am going to put on the show notes page, in addition to your book, uh, at tomwoods.com slash 548, I'm also going to put a link to an episode I did on the corporation and what libertarians should think about it, because I, I agree with you on it. I used to be wrong on that, and I later changed my mind. Uh, let, let's, let's say, no matter what the body of water is, uh, who owns the fish? Who owns the stuff in it? And how does that come about? I mean, if I'm if I've got a if I'm on the river, maybe it's a small river. It's not it's not owned by the Mississippi River Corporation. It's a small river somewhere, and you know, I I own from here to there, or whatever. Do I own the fish that are passing through at a given moment? How does that work? Well, uh, we do have uh, this group called PERC, Political Economy Resource Center in uh, Montana. And they're into a thing called ITQs, um, uh, tradable uh, uh, quantities for fish. In other words, uh, people would have a right to get a ton of fish, uh, uh, capture a ton of fish. See, there are th really three levels. One is um, fishing seasons. But, you see, if you have the tragedy of the commons and nobody owns the fish, then everyone is going to uh, you know, get all the fish they can, and then there'll be no no new baby fish, and and the fish will be uh, endangered, and then uh, will become extinct. So how do we deal with that? Well, our friends on the left, the left wing environmentalists, say, um, well, let's have fishing seasons, or let's have limitations on uh, the net size, or how, what size hole you can have in the net, or you have to throw fish back if they're less than a foot long, or whatever. Uh, that would be uh, command and control. 
moving on toward the market but not quite getting at the market would be a thing uh, like ITQ or TURF, uh, which are just acronyms for uh, various quasi-semi-demi-market situations to deal with the fish. Namely, we have a bidding uh, for the right to capture uh, or, uh, a certain amount of fish. And this would be the equivalent of, um, uh, in education, um, uh, what do they call it, uh, um, where you don't have private education, but you have vouchers. School oh, vouchers. Vou school vouchers. So that would be the equivalent, sort of a Chicago-esque way of dealing with the problem. And I think it's uh, an improvement over the command and control of, of the uh, left-wing environmentalists, but just as the Chicago school might be an improvement over the mainstream in some ways, uh, the Austrians are an improvement on that, and I think uh, the Rothbardian libertarian uh, homesteading people can do a little bit better than the ITQ. And here the, the idea is right now we have fish freedom. Uh, fish just go wherever they want. Why don't we have electronic fences? You know, it used to be with cows, uh, before we had barbed wire, they would, um, uh, what do you call it, brand them. Uh, they, you know, the, uh, you brand the cow. Well, we now have the technology to brand um, whales. Uh, you uh, shoot a uh, uh, some sort of electronic device into the whale, and that's your whale. And uh, yes, you can have poaching, but uh, you, you had cattle rustling too. Uh, one of the motivations for me was the Star Trek episode, and I forget which one, but the, our boys, uh, 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 the heroes of Star Trek, were in I don't know the 23rd century, and the people in the 27th century. I'm not sure I got the centuries right. Uh, came back to the 23rd century and were blowing it up. Why? Because there were no more whales. And uh, the people in the 27th century loved whales. So our boys, uh, you know, uh, uh, James Kirk and, and the guy with the funny looking ears had to come back to the 20th century to get some whales to bring them back to the 23rd century. So why is it that whales are going extinct? Uh, or are endangered, again, because of the tragedy of the commons. If you don't own it, you tend to overuse it or use the resource too quickly. So one way is to have these ITQs or the school voucher uh, equivalents for whales. Another way is uh, to own the whales. Now, look, if you own, a, say, a, a thousand uh, square miles of ocean and you put electronic fences around there, then we move from the hunting and gathering stages, which we were once on land and we are now on water, to uh, uh, farming uh, or uh, cattle raising. Only, look, uh, those whales are just cattle with, with funny looking fins and they don't have horns. But from the economist's point of view, we would treat the whales just as we treat cattle. And, you know, uh, the, the cattle never went in within a million miles of extinction whereas the buffalo, which were not owned, uh, almost uh, went extinct. Well, let's, uh, let's cowize the, uh, the, uh, the whales. Uh, right now, they're, they're buffalo whales, and we want to convert them to cow-type whales, namely private ownership. Uh, you might say, well, what do you mean electronic fences? We don't have electronic fences. We can't corral whales. Uh, and the answer to that is we have the technology to do it. Uh, if we can get to the moon, which is a whole other issue, we can certainly uh, get a bunch of uh, whales and porpoises and other guys like that and fish uh, to go where we want them. So, uh, I mean, we do have fish farms. You know, there was this interesting case. Um, uh, who was the bet? Julian Simon against Paul Ehrlich. And they had a bet, are we running out of resources? And uh, our guy, Julian Simon, won. Whereupon Paul Ehrlich said, okay, I'll have you another bet uh, within 10 years or 20 years or whenever the fish are, were going to go extinct and, uh, or are going to uh, become more scarce uh, and higher prices. And Julian Simon said, okay, I'll bet you, but we're not just counting um, ocean fish, we're counting uh, farm fish. And then um, uh, what the, the other guy, um, Paul Ehrlich, uh, wisely <laughs> declined to have the, the, the bet. In other words, uh, fish in the wild, you know, 1% of them or very few of them survive, whereas uh, farm fish, 99% of them survive. So what, all I'm saying is let's have farm fish in the ocean. Let's have uh, uh, electronic fences and, you know, the whales just can't go where they have to go. Uh, where they want to go, they go where we want them to go. And uh, that way... Uh, you have your whales, I have my whales, and my whales stay on my property and yours stay on your property because they've got these electronic things in them. When they get to the electronic fence, they just can't go where they want to go. 
And so what I'm trying to do is barnyard eyes, if I can use that expression, uh, the fish and the whales, so that we don't have the problem of uh, Star Trek where all the whales go away and the people from the future are going to kick our butt. All right, there's a lot more water stuff to talk about, but let's pause for just a minute for this message and we'll get right back to it. One of the things I love about the free market is that over time, people become able to do extraordinary things even when they don't have specialized training in a particular field. For example, Zappable makes it possible to design beautiful, functional mobile apps for local businesses. A restaurant can do takeout or reservations through its app. A bar can send out messages to everybody with the app telling them about a special going on that night. A doctor's office can have an appointment form. Every business can have all its social media platforms in its app. There are a ton of things you can add to these apps and sell them to local businesses or design them for charities or, again, use them yourself. Check it out at tomwoods.com zap. And don't worry, they give you step-by-step -step tutorials and even a guide for how to market them. TomWoods.com slash zap. Let's talk more about how ocean privatization could work, because I think that is the toughest for people to see. I think, well, in addition to the technological issue, which I think you could deal with with the electronic fencing, I think there are these, uh, you know, again, the presumption is that the private sector just wants to pollute, but it wants to pollute because there's no private property. But if there is private property, the incentives, of course, would be different. But I think people would imagine a, a dystopian situation in which some corporation would own the Atlantic Ocean. And th their, their thinking, I think, is that they would then impose all kinds of arbitrary restrictions on people's free use of the Atlantic Ocean. Are you able to deal with some of these wild acts of speculation? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we've got a chapter on, on that very issue. Uh, there are several complications. Uh, first of all, the pollution. I recommend Murray Rothbard's uh, essay, which appeared first in the Cato Journal in 1982, called Air Pollution. Uh, the way we libertarians see air pollution or water pollution or smell pollution or noise pollution is as a trespass. And the first guy that homesteads the, the, the stuff, uh, whatever the uh, benefit is, uh, is the owner of it. So uh, I don't think we really have to worry about pollution because uh, pollution is a trespass. And if we had law, legitimate law, uh, a guy who uh, trespasses somebody else's property would uh, soon be uh, made to pay damages and be given an injunction, which would uh, be a, a, a letter from the court saying, you keep doing that, we're putting your butt in jail. Okay, so that, that's the pollution issue, and I, I, I think that we have uh, solved the pollution issue, uh, certainly in the air and, and in uh, noise and in smells and things like that. And uh, we do go into that on water, and there's no real difference in principle. But now let's talk about, uh, apart from the pollution, how would you uh, conceptually uh, think of privatizing the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean? Well, you get into one complication, and that is, you can't have privatization for non uh, for non scarce goods, and the question is: Is the Atlantic Ocean yet scarce? And uh, this uh, the answer to that problem is sort of complicated. The, the I guess the right answer would be yes and no. Uh, let me use an analogy: uh, airplanes. Right now, when airplanes fly. They have to be like 10,000 feet from each other. So if you're going north, you're at, uh, I don't know, 5,000. If you're going south, you're at 6,000 feet, uh, 7,000 feet. And uh, is there a scarcity there? Well, it's sort of getting a little scarcer because we get more and more airplanes, and the airplanes not only have to be a, a distant height from each other, but also a distant uh, uh, length from each other. Namely, you can't have uh, one airplane uh, following another one 10 feet behind. You have to be a mile or two or three behind. So we are now running into that problem of whether the air paths are scarce or not. And right now we're sort of in a gray area. They're, they're sort of uh, semi-scarce, um, but in the future, presumably they will be. Now, with regard to the oceans, I think there's more room in the oceans than there is in the air, especially over places in Europe or the United States. So uh, when we talk about privatizing uh, the Atlantic or the Pacific, well, there are a lot of complications. <laughs> One is, is it scarce or not? And 
uh, you might make the case that right now it is not scarce and therefore we can't privatize it, which is reasonable. But the point is that as more and more boats go around uh, the ocean, uh, you're going to have congestion. And if you have congestion with boats, they'll hit each other and uh, that'll be a very bad thing. Another issue is you have really four aspects of the ocean. The first is on the top where the boats go. The second is uh, where uh, the water itself, where the, um, uh, what do you call it, submarines go or where the fish go. The third is uh, uh, right under the ocean is land, and on, on top of the land at the bottom of the ocean are uh, manganese nodules and other uh, resources. And then the fourth aspect of the ocean is underneath the land, namely oil. And uh, you you know, how do you, uh, how do you work that? So it is a little bit more complicated, although we do have analogies on the land because uh, on land you can uh, have uh, a farmer uh, puts in some crops or there's oil underneath and, and do you have slant drilling? Are you allowed to, you know, drill under somebody else's uh, land? Or uh, uh, So there are analogous problems there. So to answer your uh, question a little bit more succinctly, uh, the privatization of the oceans is not something that uh, my co-author and I said we must have right now because there is a case to be made that it's not yet scarce. But in uh, 10, 20, 50, 100 years, whatever, uh, if we have uh, more and more people and we have more and more boats and now uh, the paths in the ocean on the top of the ocean become scarce, well, then you have to have some way of deciding who gets to use the, the path from, uh, I don't know, Paris to New York, uh, the, you know, the, the great circle route from Paris to New York or the way the, the boat would go. Uh, if you have too many boats, you have to decide well, who's going to do it. Well, one way to decide is uh, non-ownership, and then you have crashes. Another way is uh, government, and I don't know who's going to be the rightful owner of, of that. Maybe the UN, and we'll have some one-world government. No, uh, I think that uh, uh, the least bad or the best uh, way to determine is who owns the ocean. And the owners of the ocean might be... Uh, that is the ocean paths for these ships might be uh, the Cunard line or these other uh, major uh, shipping uh, groups. Look, we have an analogy. Do you know how we got um, uh, standard gauge and railroads? No, it wasn't the government. It was a bunch of uh, railroad companies who got together and said, hey, look, uh, it's silly. You have tracks that are six feet wide. I have tracks that are five feet wide. This guy's got tracks that are four feet wide. And then whenever we connect, we have to load and unload. So they came up with standard gauge. The uh, railroad companies also came up with time zones. You and I were just talking before we got on the air. You know, are you central time, are you east coast time, are you west coast time? Well, who came up with that? private railroad companies. Well, if the uh, uh, various shipping lines uh, that use the ocean say, look, uh, we together have homesteaded these paths and we together are the owners of it and there are, uh, let's say, uh, I don't know, 50 of us and we 50 now have a corporation or a partnership or whatever form that you want to have ownership over and uh, here's how we're going to decide as to who has a right to, uh, uh, to use these lines because you know, uh, the big boats have to be a mile away or five miles away from each other uh, so they don't crash into each other. So, again, uh, every problem that we face on, um, on the ocean or the river or the lake, uh, there's an analog on the land. And what we're trying to do is extrapolate from the land to the ocean and uh, say that, uh, you know, here are possible ways that uh, the market can solve these problems. All right, before I let you go, I want you to explain, if you would, the concept of, of aquaculture. I don't quite get it, but is the idea that this would be – I mean, I, I think I have a sense of what it is, but it would be encouraged if we had private property rights. Well, agriculture, not aquaculture. Agriculture is just uh, planting stuff uh, on, on the land, and uh, some of the stuff we plant would be uh, flora, namely plants, and some of it would be fauna, namely cattle or sheep or what have you, and aquaculture would be very similar, uh, only instead of on, on the land, it would be on the water. 
uh, one of the biggest problems we have uh, in the book is the salmon, because the salmon are weird creatures, you know, like they start off in some little stupid lake up in the middle of, I don't know where, Alaska somewhere, and then they, they go down some river, and then they go down to the ocean, and then they have to, uh, to spawn, they have to come back. I mean, they have no decency, these, uh, these uh, salmon. They, they, they're not libertarians. They, they should confine, I'm just kidding, of course, here. Uh, but these are some of the challenges that we face in the book, and aquaculture uh, would be just the agriculture on the water. Well, I am going to recommend your book, of course, to listeners. I don't think you're going to find another book on water, uh, water body privatization. I, I think I can say that with a degree of confidence. But this book that uh, Walter Block and his co-author have just released, Water Capitalism, the case for privatizing oceans, rivers, lakes, and aquifers is the place to go, and you're going to get a lot of uh, very important food for thought. So, uh, Walter, I, I, all I can say is I can't wait for that book on outer space. And when I told uh, Heather about it the other day, her response was, and it just shows how long she's hung around with me, she said, uh, well, how could you homestead anything in outer space? <laughs> okay, all right. But, but I think the idea is if you did get out in outer space and you homestead it, you should be able to have title to it. Is that what you'd be saying? Absolutely, yes. So uh, the moon, uh, you know, we have an, anal an analogy here uh, with, with the water, with the, the roads, with the, the moon. I mean, you know, do you, suppose uh, uh, somebody lands on Mars. Does he get to own all of Mars or a little bit of Mars? How much of Mars? And now we get to apply homesteading theory, which we've applied, uh, again, thanks to Murray Rothbard and Hans Hoppe and John Locke. I, I suppose I should include John Locke in homesteading theory. And uh, we just apply it to uh, areas that we haven't applied it to before. So one of my interests is applying libertarian theory to areas where it hasn't been applied to. And uh, again, one reason is to promote libertarian theory, and another is the practical, because uh, private property and, and uh, free enterprise are the last best hopes for humanity, and that applies uh, everywhere. Well, excellent. Uh, as and the thing is that there's you know, everybody else is doing valuable work too, but there's so few people who are out there looking at the areas where we've been incomplete, where there has been oversights, where there are things where people, in theory, we say, yeah, that should probably be privatized, but nobody wants to figure out how it would be done, and you're figuring out how it would be done. So, uh, how many how many uh, peer reviewed articles are you at right now? Not counting ones that are out for review. Oh, uh, I'm almost at 500. Uh, I've got like 492 or something like that. It changes every day, so I don't I don't have the exact number, but I'm uh, approaching 500. Well, listen. Are you gonna? Are you gonna? Are you keeping track enough so that when you actually hit five hundred, you'll know instantly, or is it like three months later you'll be going through your file saying, "Oh my goodness, I'm at five oh seven. No, no, no. I keep track. <laughs> I, All I right, number, okay. I number my articles. All right, listen. When you get to five hundred, I want to have you on for a special five hundred article celebration. Oh, you're very kind, Tom, and I uh, look forward to when our paths next cross, whether electronically or better yet, personally. Absolutely, as as do I, and I look forward to the 500 article episode. I will read all 500 articles in advance of that. Actually, that's probably not quite true, but I'll read some. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll read some. All right, thanks again, Walter. Thank you for having me on your show. It's always a pleasure. All right, WalterBlock.com is the website. We'll link to that also on our show notes page for today, which is TomWoods.com slash 548. We've reached the end of another week of shows, so I want to say thank you for listening Thanks for spreading the word about the show, and thanks for supporting the show in various ways. In particular, some of you good folks started to do some of your Christmas shopping through TomWoods.com slash Amazon, and that does help me pay for the various things that I need to keep the show going, and I'm grateful to you for that very much. Next week, more fun here on the show, and remember, Contra Krugman is also running as well. Episode 12 is released this week, and this week, Krugman is actually gets something right. So we are wearing him down, obviously. What other conclusion can you draw? Check that out at ContraKrugman.com. See you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.